So, so as I start, I I reached out <clears throat> to Marshall yesterday and said, MJ, would you um, would you like to come on and discuss with me life? You know, just just what's going on in house music, day to day life, the whole thing. He said, Yeah, we've done things before him and I. We even did some in Amsterdam where we spoke on the panel about production and stuff. So it's always a lot of fun to get MJ in the house, as you can tell. And he's always has he's always has a good story, if not many good stories to come from him. From just life's path, you know, dealing with day to day, you know, <clears throat> along our journey, we have these things that happen that knock you down for a minute. You're upset but later make great stories, as we all know, or funny stories, but they're not funny at the time when we're in the middle of living it, you know, or dealing with stuff like maybe a plane problem, airlines, or, you know, nightclub and issues, people not paying you, running away. You don't even know what it is. It's like all kinds of crazy stuff. And all of us have what we call our own war stories. Mm-hmm. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce you to one of my heroes who I love and adore, always did, since the minute he started with his tracks, the minute that stuff came out on his own label, tracks records, he changed a whole genre and defined a a music that just became amazing and huge around the world called house music. And he is the godfather of house. So let's introduce my good friend, Marshall Jefferson. (laughs) <laughs> Hello, Lenny. Thank you for the tremendous introduction. <laughs> <laughs> tremendous. First, first, you know, we're always laughing him because right now he's in the UK playing <clears throat> faith. Unlike my myself, who's planted in New York, which we've gotten through COVID, you know, with a good with a good governor. Cuomo's kept us pretty safe. And right now, you know, a lot of us are not playing music. We're we're in the studio rocking beats, remixing shoring up our stuff but you know i talked to other guys yesterday and they said you know they're not working right now due to COVID, and they don't know what they're going to do and you know everyone's uncertain and i hate that word uncertain right now that's pretty much what it feels like with everything I mean, you keep hearing it i'm uncertain if i'm gonna have a job i'm uncertain if i'm gonna be able to travel i'm uncertain if i'm gonna actually survive you know but those who know, know that we have to survive regardless, okay? And Marshall Jefferson has survived different genres of music, the changes, the styles, and he's kept it one way, his way. He didn't change his beat. He said, you're going you're gonna to dance to my beat. And he, and he didn't have to say it. He did it through his music. You know what I'm saying? So... So I'm gonna let Marshall. I'm gonna let Marshall tell you where he starts from, from even pre to him making his first records. He's gonna have to tell you a little bit about himself. Okay, so I'm gonna let you take over, Marshall. Well, uh, since you brought that up, uh, you can read it all in my my book. Well, Diary of they, Marshall they, Jefferson's Diary of a DJ. <laughs> that's right. Get his but, book, uh, Diary, of a D- Diary of a DJ. Yes. Hang on. Hang on a sec. Get that book, Marshall, get that book. Show everybody. Come on, advertisement time. Everybody share this. And don't forget, this Saturday is my last webinar. We're going to talk about that. No. So Marshall's got some. Show, show it, Marshall. This is the book right here. Mar- um, Marshall Jefferson, Diary of a DJ. And, uh, yeah. Wow. That's, that's the book. But well, um, yeah, You tell us about you. Uh, I, I I hadn't promoted it because uh came out the same time uh, that uh, my friend Sleazy died. And I had to uh, I had to raise money for his funeral. And I felt uncomfortable asking people for to give money twice, you know. So all the all the money went to Sleazy's funeral and, and uh, got him buried and stuff. So this this is my this is my chance to push this a little bit. So help but, help a brother out. Let's get that book. Everybody who's on here today, order the book from Marshall. It's a great story. Since you're now yeah. here, now since you're pressing now, the book, just give us a you know, give us a, a bird's eye view of what the book is about. 
uh, well, it's just basically about my life and my journey through the music business. Uh, you know, things are things I've done where I came from. Uh, and that's it, you know, some, some funny music business stories, you know, with, uh, me and some of my friends and, you know, uh, it's some behind the scenes stuff. So it, it's, it's, uh, I don't, I don't really want everybody reading about my business like that. <laughs> Then let's ask but this question. Then why the hell did you have it written? Well, I don't know. It, I, it seemed like something to do, you know, maybe other people get books done and stuff. And I feel house music had a, needed some, a, a, a little bit more documentation and books and stuff. So that's why. When it actually came out, that then I said, oh, man, I don't want everybody to read about this. So that's... <laughs> That's uh you know I told my daughter I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you you and my son I told my daughter the same thing if you don't want nobody to know or hold you accountable do not write it down don't write it down I told my daughter all the time on Facebook don't if you don't want to be held accountable don't write it down because they can go back and go did you read did you write you wrote that didn't you so, Marshall, um, I mean, so when's the movie coming out? Because I want to see this movie. Um, I don't know when the movie uh, movie starts because of COVID, but uh, we we're scheduling. Uh, we had a tentative schedule to start filming May of next year, and uh, you know, hopefully uh, things are cleared up by then. Well. Yesterday or the day before, we saw something from Oxford. It's talking about possible vaccination. Don't know if it's real or if it's fake or what they call we in my world call it fagazi. Could be a fagazi thing. We hope there's something to look forward to. So uh. let's let's talk about one part of the which I've always you know, I remember you worked in you worked in the United States Post Office at one time. In yeah, life. worked there with Curtis McLean, Rudy Forbes, and Thomas Carr, my uh, uh, my friends from the post office who sang on "Move Your Body" and uh, other stuff. We were called on the house. Did you know that your friends sang pre to you doing this record, or this is something that happened? How did that? Well, work? yeah, you know, uh, Curtis. He was like the main singer. He would sing all the time on the job. So, so we said, so he was our default lead singer. And Kurt would sing on the on the job all the time, and he would replace words and songs. You know, I, a lot of times obscene lyrics. You know, so like, <laughs> but he but he was the lead singer. So, so he became. So you mean basically like when someone plays air guitar, they, they change, they change the parts. Like they just sit there and they play the air guitar to it or. No, nah, he was saying he, uh, you know, he would re-sing words to famous songs like Billy Jean was my lover. She just a hoe who, you know, like. <laughs> <laughs> That's, you like, you know, Why? Oh, Good job. shut up. You know. This. So he would do Billie stuff Jean's like a hoe. that. Right, she's my girl. She's a hoe too. I got it. Yeah, yep. you know. So he would replace the words. So we thought he was pretty funny, and we thought he could sing pretty good. So when he, you know, we got an idea that we were gonna, uh, uh, that we were gonna start making records. So uh, you know, I, I started writing songs and music, and Kurt was the singer, and and me. Me, Rudy, and Tom were the background vocalists. Mm. And, uh, you know, we, we called ourselves On the House. So that was the start of it. We were also DJing, me and Curtis were. And uh, Kurt taught me how to DJ. Basically, uh, Kurt taught me all the tricks the Hot Mix 5 were doing. So... You know, I tried to get that down. The Hot Mix 5 from Chicago had a radio show, you know, uh, Saturday Night night Live, Ain't No Jive. They would. It was the best mix show I've ever heard in my life. 
I mean, I, I mean, all over the world, you know, I, it, it sounds like every mixed show I hear, everybody's standing still compared to them. What do you mean by that? Tell, explain to the viewers. Well, they would play, they would play like 40, 40 songs per hour. Each song would be scratched, backspin, you know, cuts and, and phasing, you know, just, and it was just silky smooth, you know, no mistakes. They, they were the best, best uh, mixes technically I've ever heard on the radio. Mm. So that was, that was the hot mix five. That's who I learned how to, well, uh, well, I actually learned from Curtis. He showed me all the tricks they were doing, like all the back spinning and, and how to do the phasing and, and, and that kind of stuff. But uh, the template was the hot mix five. So are you a child of disco in a sense? What was the background? What was the music you listened to as a young kid? Mm, no. When I, 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 I didn't get into disco until... Um, until I started DJing. And that would that would be 81, 1981. That's the same time I started playing. And disco right. at that point was already kind of what they already called it R&B dance music as far as we knew it. Before that, I was into rock and roll. Let me let's let let me let all the children in dance music hear that again. Say it slow because they didn't hear that. They went what? <laughs> Say it again. Before before I started, uh, before I got into disco, I was into rock rock music. What what were the bands that were you you were following in those days? Oh, uh, well, it would be Cream, Led Zeppelin, uh, Deep Purple, Yes, Black Sabbath. Even Van Halen, the police, uh, you know, it, uh, it was varied degrees of hardness, you know, it looked I like, so. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, and, and uh, yeah. Did you, have long, was, did you have long hair and the whole deal? Did you have that Hendrix look? Did you, were you carrying? No, I didn't have long hair. Uh, I, I couldn't pull it off because, you know, Things got too a little bit too nappy on this end, you know. Long hair, you gotta, man, you gotta. You, you have but to I do it. remember, I do remember you having Jerry curls or something. Well, the relaxed. Yeah, Jerry I curls were a lot. That. Jerry curls were a lot, a lot easier to take care of than a natural. I remember you used to carry that hair. I'd be like, yo. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that big. It was. I think a, it was, I think it was at the garage. I mean, when I think when you came to do that, thing, it wasn't that garage. Was something you were in New York. I remember New Music Seminar or something. I remember seeing it, and I was like, "Oh wow, look at that!" No, I did, I never had a big afro. I had not I had afro, something. not afro, not afro, but but or well, big Jerry curl over yeah. whatever that is. I never had that. I had I had a lot of a, a nice head of hair though. So here you are in the bar scene, which would be the rock thing. It's like a bar thing. It's not really a nightclub scene. And, right. And you, but what makes you start to go to hearing R&B dance music? Like Hot Mix 5? Women. Women. Ah. women. Women. Hormones kicked in, bro. Just, you know, I wanted to, I had to go to the, I went to the Nimbus first and and then Copper Box and the, and the Taste and, you know, and, and that was all you know, all these, thing. all these places where the women were. That's the same thing what my friend said. You want to pick up, you better learn how to dance. And if you don't know how to dance, you're not going to be picking up nothing. <laughs> right. Uh, funny enough, I went to a club with this girl. And uh, that really turned my world around musically. And that was the music box where Ron Hardy was spinning. And like in, in that club, it was pitch black. And, the only, you know, you couldn't see the women in there. <laughs> so uh, it was the loudest sound system I ever heard 
in my life. And from that point on, it was about the music. Is it kind of like finding, you know, some people talk about it when they went, went first time to the garage, it's like they found God in a sense, not, not, not the DJ, but musically speaking, like they found something that brought them into that whole world, changed their world from that moment. So the Ron Hardy experience was that feeling. <clears throat> Ron Hardy experience. It was, uh, it, it was more profound to me uh, than the garage. I mean, once I heard that sound system at the music box, and Frankie Knuckles Club, the power plant, by the time I got to the Paradise Garage, I said, okay, this is normal. This is, you know, this is what it is, right? But those two sound systems in Chicago were prepared before the garage. Garage was a, a similar sound system, but it was different. It was a lot cleaner than, than the Chicago sound systems, right? And, uh, I mean, it, you know, it had a lot, of, a lot more clarity. but. Uh, you know, as far as like the bass hitting you, I'm, I haven't heard anything like the music box. Really? Really. Really. And Paradise Garage was a sensational system, man. Can you tell people that never experienced Ron Hardy what that was like going there, hearing him? What that whole atmosphere was like? <clears throat> well, it... That place, the, the first one on uh, Indiana, it has so much bass that if if you stood still, the kick drum would basically move you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, not I'm not talking spiritually. I'm talking physically. <laughs> it was, if you try to stay, one, I mean, it, when they it come in, boom, 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 it'll literally like move you and like. If you start out here, you know, and boom, 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 boom. This is where you would end up. <laughs> <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I it's, got you. I got you. That's how, that's how. Inches. So it's pushing you like air. It's like pushing you, forcing it's you. Pushing, right? It's pushing. It's pushing. That's how loud that sound system was. So that, so I can understand people like mistaking that for a religious experiment, experience, you know? But you, you, know hear saying, you, hear have, you hear that? You hear that a lot? Yeah. No, man, it's like religion, man. It's like going to church. You hear? Right. So that's and and that's what the garage did. That's what Zanzibar did. That's what a, you know. That's what a lot of those New York clubs did. You got that right. And and you know they, you know Robert Williams was from New York and Frankie Knuckles was from New York. They brought it to Chicago. Of course, once it got there, Ron Hardy took it and poof. He beat, the box. <laughs> he, he beat that he, box, right? He beat that box. He felt he felt everything he was doing. But I guess every DJ feels what they're doing. You know, Larry Levan would feel it too, you know. And, and, and Tony Humphreys would feel it. When they're, on, when, they're on fire, when they're on fire, when they're on fire, they're on fire, dude. They're on fire, yeah. they're on fire. Uh you know, Frankie Knuckles locked me in the club the first time I went to see him. You know, I mean, uh, they put the chain, they literally put the chains on the door and locked us all in. <laughs> Could you imagine that happening today? That would never go down. The things that we experience. Uh, somebody would go to jail. Yeah, that's exactly right. Somebody would go to jail for that. Somebody would go to jail. Yeah, but they. Those days, you that night, win. that night they they put the chains on the door. <laughs> wow, there's a couple of people remember that, you know, but uh, I don't meet too many. I guess they're all really old now, so or gone. A lot of people are, are no longer with us anymore. From yeah, a lot days. of people are no longer with us, but uh. Uh, Craig Loftus, Loftus, God didn't know Frankie Knuckles at that time, but Craig Loftus said. Uh, Frankie, Frankie said, "Hey, lock the doors. I'm about to get off, right? <laughs> lock it down. Craig, lock Craig it down." Said, Craig, Craig said, he said, "What? You say no, no Frankie? You can't say lock the doors. I'm about to get off." And, and then, 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 then uh, Craig said, well, "Frank, there's like, you know, zoning laws and other on this." And Frank said, "I don't lock give a shit. Motherfucking doors. Lock I'm those. about to get off." <laughs> They put the chairs on the door, locked everybody in. Man. 
but I didn't find out about uh, what Frank that what Frankie had said until like years ago when I mentioned to, to Craig. I said, I said, Craig, man, uh, Frankie locked me in the club the first time. You know, he said, he said, oh, oh, I remember that night. The, that was a story he told me. Wow. Frankie's a great person. May he rest in peace. Yeah. I want to ask a question that, you know, people have, what's the first record you heard out that you said, oh shit, that's my track. And you were like dumbfounded, like blown away watching the response. Oh, uh, like, to one of my songs being yes, played? one of your songs that you, Remember, you just started uh, out. You hear your first I'm song. I'm just starting out. Um, it would be I've Lost Control by Sleazy D. And uh, when Ron Hardy would throw that on, people would lose their minds, man, because, it, it, you know, everybody would start screaming. Because, it, you know, it, on that song, people would go, I would go, ah! Right, so... So when it would come on, everybody would hear the ah and start screaming and raise their hands in the air, right? They would st literally stampede the dance floor. And that was the first time I saw it. It, it was at the music box. And I said, oh, man, they jack like this to my stuff, right? <laughs> and, uh, yeah. What year was, was that? Can you tell the people out there in the world, what year would that have been? <clears throat> well, it was... Uh, it was cold, so I would think it would be either fall or winter of 1984. Because uh, Jesse Saunders and Vince Lawrence had already come out with, uh, I think, two or three songs. They, they had done uh, On and On. I think that came in out in January or February of 84. So uh, I've Lost Control wasn't an actual record at that time. It was just uh, I'd given it to Ron Hardy on cassette. And he played, and he was beating the cassette, man. No, not lo I've lost control. That was real. Gave Ron Hardy a reel without lost control on. Now, uh, we had recorded the thing directly to the reel. You know, we didn't. I I didn't record it to cassette tape on my. So, uh, so hang on. My task camp port of one. I, right? I recorded it. Studio. What was the studio now? Your setup at that time. Break it all down for everybody. Okay, I had a Yamaha QX1 sequencer. That's the one that started everything. Uh, I had a Roland JX8P keyboard. Uh, I had a, a Korg EX800 module. I had Roland tr 808s i had a a boss uh uh an eight track an eight channel boss mixer okay little well, thing you know like just about that big well and uh oh that was the that was the main thing so so basically i i was uh jamming some beats and sleazy walked in all right, all right, right. So I said, "Hey, sleep." Just say, "I lost control," right? And uh, that's what he did, man. And I and I decided to scream, you know, "Ah!" Right. So we literally recorded it directly to the reel. Yeah, mastered mastered it to reel. Gave it to Ron Hardy. Ron Hardy started playing that and this other song I did called uh, that eventually became "Under You." from my Virgo EP. And that was done in 84. Now, uh, Under You was originally named uh, The Pleasure Exchange. And uh, and uh, that got changed on, on the uh, Virgo EP because, I, I, you know, it was the wrong titles and the wrong time. If you notice the Virgo EP, it's all the times and the titles are wrong. Like everything, like everything that came out of that label. The, the time, <laughs> the time, like one song, it says it's four minutes and it's like 11 minutes, you know? <laughs> so, so it's, you know, it, but, you know, the, the, the t final titles, you know, 
kind of fit the music. I, you know, I'll, you know, it, it was good. So, so the question is, who made the mistake with the times on the records? Well, what happened was the Virgo, the Virgo EP was four other songs originally. Right. There was actually a song called Free Yourself, actually a song called Under You, actually a song called Are You Hot Enough? And actually another song called My Space. I lost the tape. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to come up with four. I had to come up with four songs quick. Four new songs. Four new songs. So there, there was one song I did with Adonis and that was called uh, My, uh, well, I don't, I don't even remember what that was called, but that became my space. And then the free yourself and the under you, well, the pleasure exchange became under you. And then uh, uh, another song I did uh, that got mastered from cassette was are you became, are you hot enough? And those, those were the four new songs that went on that EP. And uh, yeah, so that's why the times are wrong. I lost all the original, I lost all the original uh, songs and had to replace it with four new ones. Real, I, I think the four new ones were better than the original four anyway. So we're not missing anything, I don't think. Okay. <laughs> Crazy times. <laughs> Crazy times. See, guys, you got to understand some. There was no such thing as like today. You can just open up the file on the computer. You know, he was using a sequencer. These things when we were when we were making records, all of us in those days, if it went on tape and tape was gone, it's gone. There was no <laughs> let me go back and open up the hard drive and see the file. It didn't exist. Those things, yeah. if you did it, if you didn't get it right, or you did get it right and the tape went goodbye, that was the end of it. Yeah. Simple. Simple as no backups, man. No backup because backups cost money. That was tape. That's right. It costs a lot of money to have backup. <clears throat> Yeah. We were working, what kind of budgets were we working with in those days? Not even <laughs> penny or pence. Zero. Could, couldn't afford a keyboard player, so I had to play everything myself back then. Now, how's that work? You got musical background in you? No. Oh, wait. Let's see how he got this one. Let's ask that question. So how did you learn how to play piano, Marshall, so quick? <laughs> uh, instantly, in fact. I just basically uh, slowed it down to 40 beats per minute, play it, speed it up to 120, listen back to it, slow it down to 40 beats per minute again, add another part, speed it up to 120 again. But uh, it was a way you, you had to do it. You couldn't just play something slow and speed it up. Because it would sound like chopsticks, ch -ch 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 -ch, right? So you had to lengthen the notes. QX1 had a blanket function where you could lengthen every note on a track. And that's what made it sound natural. So, uh, you know, after a while, I knew exactly how much to lengthen each note to make it sound natural. And it did sound natural. Uh, and the, what helped or hurt was that the Yamaha QX1 had a terrible quant, quantized uh, algorithm in it, right? Horrible. So I wouldn't quantize things. So that's why a lot of that old stuff is all uh, over here and over there. And over <laughs> here. It's like hitting cones <laughs> in a parking lot. Uh, Oh, there goes the beat. Okay, I, I catch the beat. Oh, oh, missed the beat right there. Oh, I missed the beat right there. So, <laughs> so you know, I didn't well, quantize stuff, man. But here's, here's a question. It sounded, that made it sound real, bro. Yeah, right. But the question is, since you're playing your own piano and using the QX's, you know, whole sustain the notes and everything, who plays the introduction to move your body with all that magical piano parts? That was, that was Rudy Forbes. That was Rudy Forbes. And that and and that and that's the same thing, you know. No quantizing on there. 
<laughs> no quantizing on there, man. So you you play it out, it's gonna stay out. So was Rudy actually a pianist, or he just was somebody played by ear? What was his deal? No, Rudy was a pianist. Uh, he 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 um uh, um uh, he he played uh. He man, he played keyboards like one. He Rudy would go in and out. Sometimes he would play good, and sometimes other times he would, you know, he would be drunk and he'd kind of mess, you know, kind of mess things up and stuff. It was one time. Oh man, what a session! Uh, like I, I would play some of the solo. Like I played the solo on 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 Pleasure Control. Right, Rudy played solo on Ride the Rhythm. Uh, and I think that was it for the solos, but but that piano uh, right in that bum, 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 that's you playing those parts. Yeah, the the normal parts I'm playing. That but was here's, uh, but here's the move other your question. body piano. Don't 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 don't, don't right, and uh don't 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 and uh pleasure control uh don't 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 that's that's me playing. Once again, rock and roll guy, knows rock band music, loves rock music, finds dance music. How the hell you find piano to know where to put, you have a good ear? What is uh, it? No, shit, man. I, know. I listen to Elton John, man. Oh. Man, man. You heard Benny and the Jets, man. Elton John was a piano playing fool on that. They sound like he came right out. He, right out of the church, man. He just sounded like he just got out of church and playing for the choir and stuff. He was a black piano playing fool in the 70s. And like, it, you know, I mean, really, Elton John back in the 70s, Elton John had so much soul, he was on soul trade. They had to put him on soul trade. He had so much soul. So, yeah. So <laughs> that's where that came from. You so know, you're I'm, telling me that that piano you hear, bump, bump, ba dum bump, bump. Bum, 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 bum. All that piano parts. What inspired you to go into this Marshall Jefferson Move Your Body? It was the it was the overall piano excellence. You know, everybody wanted everybody wanted I wanted to play like Elton John, man. And and uh this is uh, for me. I never heard well, this before, everybody. Never heard well, this. this is, while I didn't duplicate anything, you know, because I he, he was just too good of a piano player. I did my little I did my little thing, you know, I wanted piano and house music. I said, well, you got it, piano and rock and roll and stuff. Why not have it in in house music too? You know, really knock it out. So you know, that's what that was the inspiration for that. But it was Elton John, man. You know, every everything comes from something. And, and uh, John's inspiration comes from something. Yeah, as well. My thing was um I I didn't duplicate things like every, well, you know, everybody else at that time would like straight ripping off, you know, bass lines and, and things, you know, while, while I didn't do that, I, uh, I, I was essentially like trying to duplicate the vibe, you know, the, the feeling, the mood and stuff in my stuff. And that's, I guess that's the kind of a messed up way of explaining it, but that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to get it like a Jimi Hendrix vibe, you know, even though you hear one of my songs or you hear one of Hendrix songs, they don't, they don't sound anything alike, but it was the vibe. You know what I mean? Let's clarify it for everyone, Marshall Jefferson. Here's the question again. Up until the point that you come out and move your body with that piano, was there any track around at the time that had that piano? That feeling. Oh. Uh, you know, um, not quite, but, but very close. Uh-oh. I hope we didn't lose him. Marshall. Sorry. 
We no, lost you for okay. a second, bro. Start again. Not quite. No, I got a phone call. But, uh, oh, no. They're breaking in. No. Everybody's like, no, people no. Are like, like commercial break. Everyone like, we lost. <laughs> <laughs> no. no. I would say the closest I, I think would be the Log album. I know you will. I know, I know Leroy you. Burgess. Right? With right. Le- Leroy Burgess. That's right. And as a matter of fact, Kurt, Curtis' voice sounded uh, a little bit like Leroy's, okay. right? So I would say I would say that Log album. It's an album called Log L O G G. Yeah, and uh, you know, it was kind of a different. It was kind of a different vibe, but it was a piano on there, and that uh, yeah. So so the Log. Leroy Leroy Burgess log album. Uh yeah. So like all of us as DJs and record producers at the time, well just to, just basically as a DJ, were you listening to the albums and going, I want my stuff to go this direction? No, I never I never did that. See, I wanted to go my own direction. I wanted to go like a, a different direction, but the vibe of uh, you know, as far as I don't think I was talented enough to to duplicate a lot of a lot of that stuff that I was hearing. So I did. I had to go my own way. Like when I did off Lost Control, uh, there was nothing out there that sounded like that. <laughs> you know, I mean, absolutely nothing. Right. But I thought it it kind of captured a uh, a Black Sabbath kind of Jimi Hendrix vibe, if that if that makes any sense. With it, the instrumentation was different, but you know I I I tried to get that kind of energy going. Right. Did you feel you accomplished that goal at that time? At that time, man, yeah. Well, you should have seen, man. I'm telling you, they used to stampede the floor when I've lost control came on, man. It let Rod Hardy would throw that on, man. Everybody go, ah, they start stampeding the dance floor, man. It was they were really into it. And that's incredible. See, unless you in your eyes, nobody would know that. Unless we know here you tell us that. I didn't know that. Incredible. Now the next uh, that, go ahead. That, there wasn't that vibe, that kind of vibe on the dance floor yet, and uh, you know things were pretty organized up to that point. I've lost control. wasn't really that organized. <laughs> Musically speaking, or what? In what way? In every way you could think of. <laughs> so, I hear you, brother. I hear you. Yeah. So not too far after that, the venture begins. Of course, now you become the go-to because when you have a hot record like hot music, house music anthem and all that stuff, where do you see yourself going now? Now that you have a record that's crossing over commercially speaking, what's well, going on in your mind at that time? What's happening in your life? Well, you know, at that time, I was... Man, at that time, I was... You know, I had a I had a few hits hits out. I didn't have much. I didn't have any money. Uh, I chased women. How's that working? You have hits out. You have no money. Because I was that same story, Tramps. Even Earl Young said the same thing to me, bro. I was broke. I'm like, how how the hell you have a record that's playing everywhere, and 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 it's there's no money. I never understand that. No, I shouldn't say that. I do know. But the people, I'm asking questions for people to hear the story, you know, the part of it. Well, if the record label doesn't pay you, then you don't get any money. Simple as that. So, you know, I, uh, so I was perfectly happy uh, just not 
thinking about music as as my main source of income. Uh, well, records as my main source of income. And I started performing live. Now, I'd done this song with Byron Stingley called I Can't Stay Away under the group name Ragtime. And uh, stop, pause. How did you meet Byron Stingley? Uh, well, I just met him one day and, you know, he, I, I heard his first record was, which was a song called Funny Love. And I really liked the words on it. And I told him, I, Hey man, I like the words, but the rest of the music is kind of weak. Say, Hey, I, I work with you. And, you know, okay. All we right. started working together. He he could write his own words. Words that took a lot of the burden off of me because I was writing, I was writing the words and the music, and uh, you know it was difficult, man. So Byron took the the word writing part off of my off of my hands. Oh wow! So uh, we took Byron and Byron Burke with us one weekend to perform. I can't stay away. You know, with me and the me and on the house, we were doing move your body in, in our heads. And we brought them one weekend. Byron said, Hey man, Byron didn't want to waste an opportunity. So he he said, Hey man, let's stay a stay a week over and meet up with some major labels. I wasn't even thinking about any major labels, but uh we came out that week and uh Every single act I got, the majors were, were were after him, you know, and everybody got signed, and and that was because Byron dragged me around all the major labels, you know. He said, "Hey, you know, this 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 is the guy that made move your body," and you know, Byron, uh, he didn't, you know, he didn't have a he didn't have a song. All he said was, "Hey, uh, we're gonna go back." And we're going to write a song. And we luckily, we went back and wrote Devotion. And that was uh, the first 10 City sing, uh, single. Okay, so hold on, hold on. Wait, wait, wait. Let me just, let me break in because I know people are asking this question. Devotion, you write, give us the studio setup, the timing, what you were doing. Did the music happen first? <clears throat> did Byron come with the lyrics first? How did that all come together? in your world as a producer? Well, uh, we were out on a double date, actually. And, uh, you know, we were all, uh, the girls, they weren't giving us no play, man. Well, I was getting play, but Myra wasn't. So, <laughs> you know, back then, you, you, you know, you stuck, you stuck by your, your boys and stuff. You, you know, it's a package deal or nothing. So, we, <laughs> so, you know, we said, so, uh, Byron started singing, you, you know, and uh, he, he, he was singing stuff off the top of his head and I locked into it. I said, Oh man, that's cold. B said, so I just came up with some music and came back to him the next day. And, uh, uh, you know that that's how we that's how we wrote it what we weren't in the studio uh writing it we we were out on a double date writing it oh wow yep so but, but so, the devotion happened because it was no play going on his end but you yeah well play. yeah you know i don't you know it myra just did you know he he didn't score that night you know he didn't <laughs> He's watching this bar. Where are you calling right now? Clarify what we got. It was just it was just that night, man. You know, it happens. You know, Byron, Byron got lucky a, a plenty of times with that. So that after night. devotion came out, I bet he got a lot of luck. A lot of luck. No, he didn't get any, man, because uh, you know, we did that and uh man. Byron Byron met this woman and a week later. He said, I'm going to marry her, man. Sandra. And I said, oh, man, 
No, B, just wait until your record comes out, man. You know, just just wait. Just 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 give just it a wait. month, man. But he wait. couldn't wait. He couldn't wait, man. He he had to marry her, man. And so he got married and man, he became the inspiration for all house house music marriages, man. He never cheated, always. Uh, I mean, he was literally like the song Devotion, man. He, 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 you know, ded- dedicated. He's about, he was about the most dedicated family man that it's the true. music business has ever seen, right? I say that too. It's definitely you true. Know? I know that. You know, yeah, so, know, you know, but I just, you know. What were you doing now? Where you're like, that, stop. That my boy, man. Don't I, get I, married, I bro. Be... Don't get married. No, man. No. Yeah. I mean, it was a good decision in the in, in the end, man, because he's got he he's got kids, Little successful kids, kids man. successful football now, he, players, wrestling. Whoever played in the NFL, man, a, Two of them. Two a world-renowned artist, man. I mean, what you know? What do you? I mean, he must have he must have like ground up steroids in their food or something, man. But like. <laughs> <laughs> hey, wait a second. Same with Kim Mazel, her son too. Another professional football player. Is it? No. Yeah. No, 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 no. I don't think that. I think you're thinking of somebody else. But uh, yeah, but well, her daughter, her daughter, yeah, uh, her daughter. Not the daughter. Who I'm thinking of? I thought it was Kim Mazel had a son. You're not think. You're not thinking of Kim Mazel. Uh, uh, but I forgot. That. I'm sorry, Kim. Wrong. Yeah, but I I just wanted Byron to, you know, kind of spread spread the love with some, uh, you know, we were running buddies, we were going out on double dates and stuff, and you know, I I, I just knew like this devotion song was going to be hot, man, and and we were going to, man, we were going to mow through all the women. <laughs> You're gonna be real. You're gonna be truly real rock stars in a sense. Yeah, man, and and he blew it, man. He messed it up, <laughs> man, by, by getting married, man. He I was, blew it all. The plan, the plan. Was yeah, but blown. I got it. But you know what? Luckily, I got a new running buddy. That was that was CC Rogers. <laughs> we we were we were walking to clubs together, and everybody would see us and. Grab all two of their women. Stay away from mine, man. <laughs> yeah, so so it worked out a little bit, but I, you know, I would have liked that to be me and Byron. No. Oh. He had other plans. Yeah, yeah. And his plan <laughs> turned out in the end turned out really well for him. And we always thank it you. It turned out really well for him. We you always know, said, he, look, look what you did. Look at look at the good kids you got. What a great dad you, know, you are. Nice stable family life, you know. Yeah, he's up in there and he would be he was in, in the suburbs of Illinois. Yeah. God bless him. Yeah. But you know, devotion. Okay, so give us the devotion whole what happened. So you know, you forgot to mention one thing. He's dragging you around. Byron's dragging you around to record labels. Where is this? Oshkosh, Michigan? Where the hell is this? Is he- no, that was New York, man. Our first meeting, our first meeting, <laughs> our first meeting was with Capitol Records. And what was that like? Tell people what that was like. Capitol oh, Records. man. Okay, so I said the wrong thing on upon entering. The a r man was sleeping on the floor. Right. And uh, I made a joke about it and he got really offended because he said, well, this is my home. You know, I laughed because I thought he was joking. You know, this Capitol Records, you know, he said he was living in his office. So I laughed about it because I thought he was joking. And. Man, he lost it, man. He kept me and Byron in there for two hours telling us how 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 much we sucked. <laughs> he said, you're unprofessional. Your music is horrible. Two you, hours? You, you, man, we were sweating bullets like a three-digit fever, man. We were, oh, man, we we wanted to hide our heads, man. He said, he said, y'all got no 
business, being in the music business, you're you're not you're never going to be a success because you can you know, you're, you're unprofessional and you got no promo pictures and you got no bios and you got no this. You're there people that take this thing seriously and uh, 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 we were sitting there like uh, <laughs> oh man i'm afraid to ask which a r person this was oh man we oh man I'm we were afraid uh, to ask probably somebody we know <laughs> man we were we were ready to call it all in man but we we met with atlantic records the next day and everything everything we got we'll take this we'll take this we'll take this <laughs> So wait, this so first you gave so wait, wait, wait. You're okay, so you're at Atlantic Records at 75 Rockefeller or at the time one at 75 Rockefeller Rockefeller. And and we met with Merlin Bob, then we met with Timmy Resford, then we read, you know, we just read uh, so wait, 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 wait. Tell people now you're in the reception area, you and Byron waiting to go in to see it, these guys, the AR guys. What were you thinking at that moment? saying after what happened in Capitol Day before. What was that like? Like you guys because I know how I Oh, we were scared. We were scared as hell, man. Scared of what? Man, we was you know, somebody another major label was going to tell us how you know, how bad we were, how much we sucked and how much, how unprofessional we were, man. Man, we shoot. Man, we walk in there. They really early. said that to you. They really said you sucked. Oh, man. Man. <laughs> Man, man, I'm telling you, man, we we got up. Hey, people don't know. Up in, they don't know any of this. They only see the record becomes huge. You hit on the radio. They have no idea what the walk of shame is like. What's the walk of man. shame in Capitol Records for you? What were you say to each other? We're done. No, man, we didn't. Man, we were totally like deflated, man. We didn't say anything, man. We just went back to the hotel and went to sleep. Didn't say nothing. <laughs> nothing to say bro you know wow nothing to say i know byron a long time like i know you know him longer than i do but i know him pretty i've never heard him tell me the Capitol record story i think he probably doesn't want to remember that either man man i was ready to call it all in lenny i'm telling you man i just I said oh, uh, see, i remember things and you remember this too like you go see a and r guys that say put your put your demo in the box like go away who are you i mean, i tell uh, them all the time they shut the door on you they were nasty mothers in those days oh man well, we 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 got the, we had the nastiest a and r meeting of all time man <laughs> Academy Award version of that. Oh man, it, this was the worst. And I, so you know, but what records did you play him that he said you suck? I want to hear that one. Ah uh, man, I, what would have been you have been playing? What was what was the records you were playing? How move your body? What were you playing? No, we you know we, we had a. Uh, we had a couple of demos and stuff, man, but nothing, nothing actually finished. You know, uh, we had I, we had ideas, but we were just there to make the connection, and then we spent, you know, we we'd uh, finish some songs later on. That was our plan, I think. And uh, you know, like I said, when we, when we first walked in there, man. Uh, uh, a and our man was sleeping on the floor. I said, I said, oh man, you sleeping on the floor? He said, Yeah, this is my home. And I laughed, right? Yeah, but you didn't laugh didn't, and, like laugh at him, like go, ha ha, you're homeless. What, what no, kind of man. Laugh, it, what kind of laugh but see, like it? I didn't know. I, I I thought he was joking, man, because this is so what I would have thought the same man, thing. I thought he was a millionaire. So did I. I would have thought the same thing if I walked in. You know, so I, you know, I, I laughed. I thought he was joking. Right? No, he wasn't joking. <laughs> so when you left that meeting, were you so angry? You said, in the, in your, cause like, I know man, I wasn't angry at all, man. I was like deflated, man. I was, oh, man. You know, uh, shit. Like I guess movie. I ain't shit. You know? <laughs> so you know, that's what I've said to myself. I didn't say it to be, you know, I, I just, I didn't, you know, we no, didn't say you were, nothing. You just quiet about it. You just felt yeah, like just quiet. Someone man. just ripped out your guts. 
basically just <laughs> ripped everything out of you, and you're just sitting there going, I got nothing left now. Uh, that was it, man. That was it. And we came back, we came back the next day and talked to Atlantic Records, Merlin Bob, man. He he, he, he said, Oh, I said, what you got? You got this here? Oh man, that's jamming, man. Oh, bring me some, let me hear some oh, more. That's just hot. It's fire. Oh, we, that's got, fire. we got this too. Oh man, I love that. It's all, all right. Oh, we got this too. Oh man, oh man. Hey, you need to, hey, just let me know, man. I'll sign it all in. You know, oh, so after that meeting, we, hey, okay. And, uh, all right, you start thinking, we got a chance now. Yeah, man, we got a ch- we had a shot then and stuff, man. And, and uh, did you know who Merlin Bob out. was? Did you know who Merlin Bob was at that time? No, Byron did, but I didn't. Okay, because was Merlin at that time playing on WBLS as a DJ? The mix shows. Yeah. Merlin was definitely playing on WBLS, and and uh, you know he had played Move Your Body, and he had played uh, a lot of our stuff. He played, he, I think, he even played I Can't Stay Away. So, so, you know, he knew the vibe and, uh, basically he, he wanted everything. You got to understand uh, something now, mind you, you got to remember now the Paradise Garage is in full effect still going as maybe it hasn't ended yet. And your records were also huge in New York clubs because we were all well, playing them. We were all playing your records. You know that you remember. Well, with Atlantic, uh, Merlin, uh, the first record he signed wasn't actually Byron's record. It was C.C. Rogers' record, Someday. And, and, uh, Say that once more again. What record was that? That was Someday by C.C. Okay. Rogers. You heard that. His, his hangout, his new hangout partner, Someday gets signed by Atlantic. Yeah, and, and, and C.C., C.C., uh, he, ba- he basically sang that song in one take. And Merlin heard it from the get go. He, you know, he's oh, this is this is a classic right here. So he signed he signed that to Atlantic Records immediately. Uh, me and Byron went home and wrote Devotion after that uh, meeting, and that was, you know that's when we had the double date and all that stuff, and and we wrote the song. And like after that double date, he met his wife, his future wife, and Andrew. you know. That ended all the hangout time. <laughs> now it's just all business now. Yeah, my, I, I was I was without a running buddy until I ran into CC. How did you meet CC? Well, uh, CC had this manager named Billy Press. He ran Club Eighty Eight Zanzibar uh, and uh, Club America in New Jersey, right? So, you know, we played there. Billy gave us like first class treatment, man. He like, um, you know, gave gave us a hotel room, gave us limousines everywhere we wanted to go, and all this stuff. And just gave gave us champagne and all. That, you know, it pulled out all the stops. Right. So it was really like that back behind back in those days behind the scenes. In huh? those days, it was mandatory to to have a, a limousine take you to every gig. In the rider, right? In 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 New York, on the East Coast, and 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 in New Jersey, uh, mandatory. You would get a, a limousine every single club you played at. Now, also, there were separate uh, sound systems and and light and and uh, separate sound systems for the DJs and the performers. Right, every sound system was a, a Richard Long sound system. That was at every club we played at. They had written, they had excellent sound. It, it was first class everywhere you went. And uh, uh, there was one year, I think it was 88, or it started in 87, because all those beautiful clubs were laundering money for the mafia. <laughs> and the IRS caught them. And they closed down every single one of those sensational, the greatest clubs that history has ever seen. All of those clubs got closed down at the same time. And the only one left standing was Junior Vasquez Sound Factory. <laughs> After, <laughs> it was a big cleansing of mafia money. 
that was Julie, we'll that was Giuliani. Giuliani handled that one. But, that but see, yeah. Uh, but but see, like um, that um, that it was just a special vibe, man. The mafia would stay out of the business and just give the club the the, the you know they would just give like the the guys money, and they didn't care how they spent it. So it, it was basically unlimited funding in these clubs. The DJs were getting paid thousands per night to DJ. You know, that everything was first class in these clubs because they were laundering money. They, you know, they weren't concerned about profits. These gigantic clubs, man, and 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 but they you did know, make it, a lot of money. Those clubs did in New York make a lot. They, they did, did make a lot of money. They a did lot make of a lot money, of money, bro. A lot but of I'm, money. I'm, I'm, I'm saying for they spared no expense. You know what I mean? The DJs were paid like loads, man. And it and man, every club was special. Every club had a special sound system, special lighting system, first class seating, and all this stuff, man. It was it was the greatest, it was the greatest club scene I'd ever seen. An experience, and, right? And all of it, all of it got shut down, man. They took they took a uh, it, it, they took, uh, man, they just took the rug out from under everybody, man. The, once the IRS got, got in there, man, all the clubs just start. It was a mass closing, man, everywhere. And like you said, an ethnic cleansing. A cleansing, man, a cleansing. Cleansing. And everywhere. And to the point where nobody remembers that club, that kind of club scene anymore. I know it does. It only ones that remember is us. Yeah, who was part of it? Who who lived it, worked in it? The others don't remember it. They don't even know it existed. Yeah, but it was you know it was it was a great time for DJs. Like I said, that every DJ had his club. He was getting paid thousands per night. You know, like uh, it, it, say a DJ like uh, DJ Baby J over at Roselands. You know, he had you know. He had his night, you know, Roman Ricardo over at 1018. You Roman know. Ricardo. I always say the same. Roman, Ro- Ricardo. Roman Ricardo. And, and, <clears throat> and you know, it's, it's, uh, it, was, it was just special, man. Yeah, that was New York. That was New York at the end. That was New York. And it, you know, it all now, stopped mind you, at Check one. this out. Check this out. People who had went dancing in the 70s said to me, at that point, the club scene sucked. Right. Meanwhile, meanwhile, no, wait, wait. Meanwhile, the other side, I say, compares to what we have now, and I go back to then. I say, wow, wow. Yeah. Because there's no clubs like that level of excellence. Care and sound, care in the people, care in the DJ. I mean, yeah, the DJs get take well taken care of now, but I'm talking about care of well, place, no, sound. no. Not the house DJs. They they have the guest DJs are taken care of. Right, now. you know what I mean. The guest DJs. The house DJs back then were getting paid thousands a night. Three grand a night was normal, right? Now, the the resident DJ is getting like fifty bucks. <laughs> yeah, he gets a thank you. If he that, a, right? He gets a thank you. If, thank if the you. owner can find somebody to p- play for free, he'll 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 get the free guy. Because a lot of DJs just want to play in front of a crowd, right? So the guest DJs are getting a lot of money. But the resident DJ? Mm-mm. No, 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 no. That's right. Not, the not, resident not, DJ in those days, he pulled the crowd into that room. The resident DJ in those days, he pulled the crowd, and it was his club. That's right. Every club was his club. Uh-huh. Red Parrot? That was that was Gail Sky King's club. Where's she? Where's our Ooh. girl Gail? Where is she? Come on, Gail. She's got to be out there. Come that, on in. That was her club. That's you know, right. Gail every Sky DJ King. had their own. Every DJ had their own club. Man, it was spectacular. You know, and and there were no guest DJs like Danny Danny Rampley. He it, over in London, man. He had no guest DJs. They played. You know, from- every DJ had their club. You played from but, opening to close. Yeah. Now, people open up a club, 
immediately. They, they start booking guest DJs. Well, you know, if you if you do nothing but book guest DJs, your club ain't going to last long because you got no vibe. You know, you got no every because every DJ has a different vibe, you know. Well, that's why I try to tell people now you get you get your resident DJ. And you make it his club, you save a ton of money, but you and, and, and your club has a vibe, man, that everybody can lock into every week. They know what to expect. You know, they 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 got that. They have that DJ's vibe. But people, you know, they they just do guest DJs all the time. And I I I know that you know if somebody list, is listening to this, it may screw me up in the long run because I am a guest DJ. But like, <laughs> it's the better way to go, man. You're have, damn right, Skippy. Personality. Damn right, because resident DJ for me working for Bear Jones and Underground. I made good mm-hmm. money, but not like Larry Levan money and not like Jellybean money. I remember Jellybean was the well, highest because, paid DJ in New York at that time. That's so because you don't have the mafia laundering money through there anymore. That's right. And I talk <laughs> about it all the time. I used to see those guys come to pick up their collections on a <clears> Sunday <throat> morning. They used to come with the envelopes because I used to wait to get paid. <laughs> So you be sitting there and here comes Joe Scaturo or this guy, <laughs> whatever it is, whatever it was yeah. back then. Okay. The Colombo family, yeah. whoever it was, but here's the thing. And Earl Young says, we're going to get to Earl Young in a minute in your life, you know, meeting Earl Young, because I know that story too, but I want you to share that with everybody. Earl Young said it so perfectly well. He said, Lenny, I love working for the mafia. I work five nights a week all over the place, and we got paid. I never had one problem when I worked for them. New yep. York and New Jersey and Philly, he said. If you yep. work at those clubs, you got paid. That's right. Nobody left without getting paid. That's right. So it just brings us now to the story of Marshall Jefferson meets disco. Earl Young, to bring Earl Young to Chicago. Tell us how that happened, brother man. Well, you know, man, <clears throat> I was a, uh, you know, we were all big fans, man, and uh, I said, man, let's get Earl, let's get Earl Young in here on the drums. He played on all that Philadelphia stuff, and and uh, called him up, said, yeah, man, uh, I'm I'm with this group called Ten City. We want you to play on our album and stuff, the whole album. I said, I said, okay. Uh, what kind of drum machine you want me to use? I said, drum machine? Your arms, man. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't want no drum machine. I can do a drum machine myself. <laughs> but what? You know, like, he said drum machine? <laughs> yeah. but maybe an Earl the time machine? Young says, what drum uh, machine you want me to do? Apparently, apparently he had been, become very proficient at drum machine programming. And stuff. Oh, said, really? No, I didn't bro. know that. No, wow. I said, no, we want you to hit them scans again. So, uh, you know, that was that was what happened. Then we flew him to Chicago and he played on a, you know, he, he played on several songs of ours. Where did you do all that stuff with Ten City and the Earl Young experience? Uh, we did it at the studio called Chicago Tracks, and we did it at this other studio called Chicago Recording Company, CRC. Are those uh, engineers, yeah. engineers were Julian Hertzfeld and Tom Hansen. What, we, what kind of gear were you working on those days? Not Fisher-Price. I know it ain't no Fisher-Price stuff. You work on some uh, same thing, Roland JX8P keyboard, EX800 module, seven, Roland 707 drums, and Earl Young. We mean and the Yamaha QX1. We mean Earl Young. Young. Mean Earl Young. Who's, who, he bought his drums from Philly with him? Nope. We had to provide a drum set, set kit for him. And the studio had drums there. Boom, he just hopped on them and jammed. Mm. As soon as he heard that's the way love is, he said, we're about to put some gold on the walls. <laughs> is that what he said? Just like that? That's what he said. Wow. 
That's what we're about to put some gold on the walls. Wow. Yep. That's got profound. In there. That's profound because it really did go, didn't it go gold? Yes, it did. Tell people what gold means because they don't know. You know, you got some young kids that stepping up in here. What does that mean, gold on the wall? Uh, gold records, man. Gold, gold records. Was that 50 copies? What is that? Tell them the numbers. They don't know. People don't know. Well, how uh, many records uh, you got to sell to make well, gold? It's different. It's different in that every territory. You okay, know, United States. New United States. United States, a gold album at that time, I think, was half a million copies. Gold in the U- United Kingdom, I think, was uh, either 60,000. No, it was 100,000 copies. 100,000 copies in the UK for a gold record. Now, we're talking the Devotion single went gold or the album went gold? Or everything? The album, the album foundation went gold. Somebody just said something interesting, asked the question, who did the strings on the on those records, the string work? Who was involved in that? What uh, was that? Was that keyboard strings? On, on, on That's the Way Love Is or Devotion? Break it down one by one. Devotion first. Devotion first. Okay, Devotion. Well, man, I forget their names, but it was Byron's name. friend. That's his name. It was, Real it was Byron's. Name. Byron's friend from college, and uh, uh, it was it was him and and he had two women, and they played the strings. Uh, so they were three three college students, and it was all violins. Uh, same thing for that's the way love is, you know. And and uh, by that time they, you know, devotion had come out. And uh, the kids were famous and they had a lot more confidence. So they played That's the Way Love Is a, a, a lot be- better and more comfortably than Devotion. But it was the same three players. Oh, wow. So they played that- For horns on That's the Way Love Is, we used Grand Staff horns. That was Orbert Davis, who's the leader of the Chicago Jazz Philharmonic Orchestra now. And... Uh, <clears throat> And uh, he, you know, grand staff horns, that was uh, two trombones, two trumpets, two saxes. Oh, wow. And that was, that was for that's, that's the way love is. And did you multi-track them did, to make them bigger or what'd you do as far as that goes? Well, <laughs> no, they, we we multi-tracked them, but they still didn't go big. They didn't sound big because, uh, you know, I, I didn't, I didn't know how to record them properly at that time. And I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I know how to record, re- record them correctly now, but back then. Didn't the engineer, didn't the engineer, did the engineer say to you, Oh, you can do this or they just stood there quiet. What was that like for working with the engineer? That's right. No, at that time, I, I, you know, it was kind of like my way and, and, (laughs) and, uh, and the engineer in the end, it kind of took, took the criticism for it. But, you know, like they were way better engineers than me, but I didn't, I didn't have any concept of engineering. I said, Hey, this, this is how we're going to do it. And uh, they were new. T- they were too nice to tell me how stupid I was. <laughs> you know why? Why? Because you're paying them. Well, uh, you know. Th- we all I been down that took, road. We all been down I that think, road. I think they took pride in, uh, in uh, a lot of that stuff, even though, you know, uh, you know, even though I I made a lot of uh, novice mistakes, they you know they still they they still were proud of me. They, they said I did that, I did that, you know. But I you know I I was responsible for a lot of the bad sonic decisions 
anything anything that sounded good, it was because of the engineers. Anything that sounded bad was because of me. <laughs> Merlin Bob, Atlantic. Merlin Bob. Timmy Regisford, they're a and r the project, right? Why are you doing this? Well, Timmy <laughs> Regisford was, didn't do it because he was with MCA. Oh, that's right. I forgot that time he was in Atlantic, but. Yeah. What? Merlin Bob was with Atlantic. Timmy Regisford was with uh, MCA. Timmy Regisford wanted to sign uh, another act of mine, uh, uh, Paris Brightledge. But uh, Paris has signed with uh, DJ International, so he couldn't do it. But going back to the Merlin Bob question, I'm going to ask: You're in the studio, <clears throat> young, all that stuff. You have to get the okay from Atlantic. How much in depth were they as far as decision making and getting that final mix that you got to? What was their day to day with you? Basically, the, our our relationship with. Atlantic was, hey, whatever you come up with, we'll put it out. I, I, I know it's going to be jamming. And they pretty much let us, you know, let us do it. So you had an they, open checkbook basically with them? Not no open checkbook, man. They only gave us 50 grand for the first for first album. That's a lot of money back then and still a lot of money today. In today's world, it, with nothing. In today's with world, nothing, it's with no, with no Right. With no but. You get another act that gets eight hundred thousand, and you say, "Oh, fifty grand ain't nothing." Yeah, what the hell am I going to do with fifty grand now? And you're in those expensive yeah. studios, right? Well, that well, studio studio costs and stuff. Can, you know, and and remember, we use live string, live horns, live you know, live musicians, bass players, guitarists, bon, uh, percussionists, and all that. Uh, so, and you know what we and then we're splitting it between four people you know what's left which was under five grand so you know you do the math ain't much yeah. there ain't much there wasn't much wasn't much there so damn, boy, damn damn yeah but they you know they basically said okay well you, you know you got devotion out and, and you got and you got uh right back to you out and stuff and Whatever you know, uh, we'll give you fifty grand, make an make an album, and that's what we did. And you made a great album, as far as I'm concerned. Foundation is a hot album; still holds the test. The songs are great. I mean, it's no, it's not like a joke. It's a great album. Yeah, it is. you know, it made a profit. I can say that much about it. And, and it went gold. I know that, and it really did go gold to the wall, we say, in the business. Yeah. But, you know, one thing I noticed about the Someday record, the bass line? Mm-hmm. Boom, 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 boom. You, did you play that? You played that? I played that. I played every on? instrument. I played every instrument on Someday except for the congas. Here's the thing. That was David Josias. That record seems to have set up a, the sound of a lot of producers that came after. Someday. Yep, that bass like C.C. Peniston's got that feel in her record. A lot of the deaf mix sound came uh, from that big bass sound, that, that same type of feeling with the piano. And well, that like, wasn't, you know, I don't think it set up a sound. I think people just ripped it off. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that's there's a point. difference. Some point. Well, there's, you know. there's a difference, you know, like uh, copying, you know, like catching somebody's sound and actually like ripping off a bass line <laughs> or, or a piano line, right? So there's a, there's a difference. But see, I, I noticed it at the time. I remember hearing your record and then I heard Seven or eight records come out afterwards. It sounded very reminiscent of someday. And well, I, I I don't want to comment on people that have uh, been inspired by me because I may put, piss somebody off. <laughs> <laughs> Right. I'm not, I don't want to name names. That's not what I'm here to do. It's not, that's not, I'm, yeah. I'm just saying that 
Yeah. Sometimes you make a Picasso and then all of a sudden you don't see that Picasso. That you see <laughs> Picasso and the versions of what they want you to see Picasso. If you understand what I mean. Yeah. Okay. But you did notice. <laughs> you did notice that at the time, didn't you? Oh, I noticed it. You know, You're I like I noticed what the hell's lot. going on here? I'm hearing my record sound on it like 10 different records now. I mean, it's, it's, it's flattering, but at the same time, you ain't getting no coins off that. No, no. Flattery means no, nothing if you're starving. Were you still working at the post office? You already left at that point. Uh, no, I'd already left at that point. There was a long time when I didn't have any money because I, you know, when Move Your Body came out, I quit my I quit my job at the post office because I thought I was going to be rich, and the money didn't come immediately. <laughs> but you always retained your publishing, right? That you kept. Yeah, yeah. For the most <sighs> long story, we know that story. It's in the book. Buy, buy the book, people. That's in the book too. He's got that. But there's questions I'm probably asking that's not in the book because these are questions you have to know being in our world to know to ask those questions. You know what I'm saying? Like you have to live this life to know that stuff inside out. And thankfully, mm -hmm. I've been able to experience it as well and enjoy it. But also there's a lot of darkness that comes with our life <clears throat> and the hardships yeah. that we all deal with. All of us have dealt with, you know? Definitely. I mean, this is calling it being real now. You know, everybody sees us, they see us smiling and we're having a good time and, you know, we're DJing, everybody's happy, but they don't know the also the dark side of dealing with the lawyers, no coins, people taking your shit and running with it. Here's a question that everybody always asks me, or should I ask you, have you ever sampled anybody else's record? No. Why? Because everybody samples my record, and I, I, and I hate it every time it happens. And I know, I know how that feels, you know, to have, I can imagine how like some of the Philadelphia people or some other people feel, you know, they, they hire these big string or these big orchestras, right? And, uh, you know, they get all this, these instruments down, all these trained musicians, excellent musicians. And some kid in his basement sample, samples the record, not, not only gets the credit for it, but he gets all the money for it, too. So I just, you know, that's a lot of people get upset with me. I, I miss out on a lot of collaboration because of that i said hey i don't sample anything man i don't you know i don't i hate it with the passion i don't like it because i don't like anybody doing it to me so i'm not going to do it to somebody else so i you know i play all my i play all my ideas you know i don't i don't i don't sample somebody and rip off their stuff one one thing i wouldn't even know how to like clear samples if i did it and it, because i never tried and i, I don't want to try it so, you know, you know, that's just me not saying there's not a crea creative process to sampling and using it. But, man, I just wish people would alternatively try to play their own stuff or, or even if they can't play it themselves, get a keyboard player and partner up with a keyboard player. Say like Cole, like like Clavillis did when he got David Cole and, you know, they turned into CNC Music Factory. You know, uh, Clavillis didn't play, you know, of course, David Cole played all the keyboards, but Clavillis, he he came up with all the danceable ideas, right? So you team up with a musician to get it done. Don't just, like, rip off an old record and stuff. Oh, I'm, I'm talented, you know. <sighs> but that's just me. That's all right. And that's you know? called you being you. And that's what makes yeah. you the artist and producer you are. And writer, and there's nothing wrong with that. That is a good way yeah. to be. And me should be more people like you out there. Because what I've been hearing lately is, it's not even sampling. I've heard people take the whole record and just yes. throw some drums on there and call it theirs. Not even do anything to the record. Just put it in and go. 
Yo, that ain't your record. Hey, hey, Lenny, give me five minutes, okay? All right, I'll talk to the people while we wait for you come back. Go ahead. All right, ahead. mute me. I'm going to mute him. <laughs> Let's mute Marshall. So this is actually probably one of the in-depth interviews I've done over the years on Facebook. And I got to tell you, man, Marshall is a legend. He's been through a lot of things in his life. And to hear him talk and tell us step by step what's going on and the questions I'm asking, I'm trying to read what you guys are sending me. At the same time, I'm trying to implement them into the session. This Saturday, this coming Saturday, I have my last producer webinar. And this week, I decided to have a kind of a masterclass Zoom meeting with one of our legends of the godfather of house music, Marshall Jefferson, how important what his lifestyle is like making the records and how important these records are to the community and around the world. And this is why I been doing my webinars to help people out during COVID. And we've had some great results. I hope for my last class, all of you tune in this Saturday, 11 a.m. New York City, Eastern Standard Time. It's normally two hours. I do it. We're doing a special price, $19.99 for each seat in the Zoom class. $19.99 will be my last one. And we're also doing additional webinars throughout the end of the summer into September or close to October. We'll do some more. I'm going to do another master class as on what do you do with your track after you master it. And we spoke about the old school way of doing things. If you guys were listening about the A&R person at Capitol Records, who the hell ever thought? that Marshall Jefferson would be screamed at for two hours with Byron Stingley from 10 City about how horrible their music was. Is that not crazy or what? You all think you have it hard now? You get to put your records out. Could you imagine, could you imagine being, I'm gonna unmute you. Hang on, bro, I'm unmuting you. Can you imagine being all in, right. his, in his position, I'm telling the people, I'm just recapping. I said, could you imagine being in his position? You just now starting out, your records are getting played out. And one of the a and people from Capitol Records is bawling your ass out, telling you how crap your music is. Makes you want to stop what you're doing. And I understood what he's saying because it's happened to all of us. You get the wrong a and guy on the wrong day. You think <laughs> your hot stuff is hot? Now you are in the not. That's how it changes within seconds. You're like... Yo, well, I, in his defense, in his defense, you know, he was under a lot of pressure, obviously, you know, so he was probably just venting. OK, you but, know. but that could have been a moment where you said, well, let's pack it in, guys. We're done. Oh. And saved yeah. you 30 more years of, of, of glory and success, and hardship, hate, love, uh, good times, bad times, all of it that goes into this music thing. Everything. It's not just, everything's not just, you know, what I always say, caviar dreams, caviar wishes. There's also some doo-doo on the ground that we deal with, too. You know, it's like, you know, how do we survive through this? And Marshall's testament to survival. That man has been through... I don't want to say, I'll let you tell him. I'll let him tell you a little more. We're going to keep going a little more and let him wrap into what he was saying. So where were we at, Marshall? You were saying something before you said, I got to run for five minutes. Keep him, keep him there. (laughs) I kept everybody everybody waiting for you. They're coming back. He's back. He's back. Everybody tune in back. He's in. Okay. So Marshall, you taking us down the Earl Young, the disco, the house, CC Rogers, the whole thing. Oh, I remember when I was speaking to you, there was years that you weren't doing any music. What were you doing in those years where you said, I, I'm not feeling this anymore? Well, um, I, I, just basically living life, man. I mean, you know, just hanging out with my friends and stuff. Uh, and that was basically it. People thought uh, you left the music industry. Did you actually leave or you just paused? What'd you do? Well, I just paused. Uh, you know, I, I just took a break. And uh, I, you know, I, like I said, I just hang out, hung out with friends and just uh, 
uh, took a break. My father had my father had died he uh, of cancer. You know, like the we moved him in with me, and uh, you know, uh, uh, took about a year year and a half before he finally died, and you know, just looking after looking after him and and that kind of thing. And when he died, uh, there were. Uh, a few, well, about a year after that. And then I said, okay, well, I got to get out and I got to start moving again. And then I started uh, doing the DJ thing again. Where did that begin for you? Was it Chicago? Or what'd you do? Did you stay in Shire or you went to the UK? Where did you go? Uh, I, I went to the UK and started DJing. Why did you pick to go back to the UK? Well, I, you know, I, I wanted to get out of my house. I don't know why, why I had to go all the way to the UK, but I, you know, I wanted to get out of my house. <laughs> you could have moved to Florida. Why the UK? Was it because yeah. there was work? Was there work waiting for you? What was it? Yeah, what? there was, there was work I- waiting for me in the UK. So that's, uh, you know, I, 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 I somehow wound up, uh, at my friend Zeki's uh, house, uh, Zeki Lynn, and we started working on some music together, and I started DJing from that point. What year was that when you came back? I think it was 93 or 94. And uh, I did a couple of things with MCA Records, and uh, I, I, I produced Tom Jones, and and uh, I, you know, I did a, did a song on his last gold album that was uh the lead in how to sing swing it and uh the song i did was called love is on our side and and uh uh fortunately fortunately that went well and and sonique uh covered the song a few years later on her gold album uh and so I guess the song worked out. Maybe I might redo that song. That's a good song, bro. Yeah. So here you go, and you get the DJing back. You're starting to feel that powerful feeling again. You got gold records kicking around. It's the 90s, the golden era of house music is cooking. Yeah. We remember it. Keep on going. Keep us tuned in. Where are you going from there? Where do you set up base, home base at that point? Where does home base become? Well, the first home base was in Chelsea off uh king's road and now that, that was with zeki uh, again uh you know that was that was a a good four years and then and then uh zeki got met his wife oh got another married. running part of boss <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. so so I, remember I, lost, Zeki. I, I remember Zeki. Well, I, I haven't heard his name in a long time. Yeah, I lost. So I lost my second running buddy. Well, well actually, my third running buddy. You know, and uh, and I, then I moved to Bill Ricky in Essex. Ooh, he's an Essex boy. Essex. <laughs> yeah, es- Essex boy. And uh, I stayed at Essex for what, six years, and then uh, from there. I went to Manchester, where I uh, where I'm at now. But all this time, I'm going back and forth to the states. Right. What made you stay there? In the UK. Yes, sir. Well, uh, you know, most of my work is in Europe. Uh, the United States doesn't really have a, a a club network like Europe. You know they, you know, the U.S. will book you, and sometimes you know, sometimes they'll pay your price, but they'll complain about it. <laughs> so, well, they're giving you the money, right? Damn, yeah, man, this costed me a lot. Yeah, man. the flight. Yeah. Would you want? So it's, no, a, it's a struggle in the USA, man. No, but it, I can't pay you dinner, man. But you know, 
<laughs> in, in, in Europe, it's, it's business as usual, you know, but like in the States, man, you know, it's... What? You, How much you yeah. want? What? Yeah. In the States, uh, you, you don't have the mafia in the clubs anymore, so they can't pay you, right? They don't want to pay. No, they have the people in the clubs. They just don't want to pay. That's the problem. I remember. I remember uh, one time uh, there was uh, this guy, and he said, uh, "Yeah, man, we want you to uh, play at our 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 club in Chicago." You know, and I'm in the UK at the time, so I said, "Oh, yeah, we want you to take Frankie Knuckles' uh, uh, place." I said, "Okay." So he said, uh, yeah, Frankie was Frankie was playing here for for a little while and stuff. We were paying him, we were paying him 75 a night. We'll pay you a hundred. Right? <laughs> so I, you went. I said, I said, you talking $75? He said, yeah. <laughs> I said, oh, bro, well, you know, a flight from the UK to Chicago is over a thousand, you know. So are you gonna pay for my flight? Oh man! <laughs> so, what do you think? You were living in town? Uh, no, he knew I was. He, he knew I was coming from Europe and stuff. I said, I said, man, I, I, that ain't gonna work for me, man. I can't. <laughs> you know, I, I love Chicago, but not that much. I ain't gonna lose a, th- a thousand a week playing there. You can't even get a drink on seventy five dollars a night. Hey. Hey. It is what it is, but you know what? No, but it what it was was Frankie. You know, he he was just you know, he just wanted to play, keep it, keep sharp. You know what I mean? Because I I tell I'm telling you, Frankie was getting a minimum twenty five grand a night. I know, I know, man. You know, Europe. minimum uh, for playing out over in Europe. So you know, dude said, dude said, yeah, hey, man, we you, we pay you pay you a hundred dollars. Frankie probably like laughed to himself, uh, yeah, well, well, whatever you come up with, you know. As long as I got a place to hang my hat tonight. Yeah, that, I just want to keep sharp, you know. Yeah. And very informal situation, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> see what I'm saying, people? See how I just said the pitfalls of our life? You get that phone call, you're like, okay, sounds great. How much you paying? Well, $75. What? $75 what? $7,500? No, no, no. $75. You're like, nope. Bye. <laughs> well, you know, I might have done it if I was in Chicago. But, yeah, you if know, you're in I, town. I spent a, a, thousand, a thousand a week to fly there. That's uh, kind of, I kind of had to draw the line there. Mm-hmm. Speaking of today, I got off the phone with you yesterday when we caught back up. You said you're working on new product of Ten City. What's that like? Tell everyone. Promote that <clears throat> with. Uh, well, we got Marshall back together again. Tell us. Yeah, we got we got some nice stuff for the album, man. Stay tuned. You know, uh, we we finished uh, we finished it, but we're in the process of doing extra songs now. Cause uh, you know, just, we're not doing it for extra money. We just want want you, you know, there's songs we want on the album and stuff. So that's what we're going through right now. But the album is is finished right now. We're just adding extra extra songs. All right. Yeah, so but, here we uh, got. Let's recap. We got a movie in the process. A book that you promote. Yes. Put the book back up. Show everybody the book, please. <laughs> Sure, right. Get your asses. Get get Marshall Jefferson's Diary of a DJ by Marshall yes. Jefferson. Yes. Real quick, Marshall, tell us what that was like writing a book. What was that like? Uh, like writing a book. You know, I mean, you know, people. Know, a lot of people never get a chance to write a book. What's oh that like? man, it was easy. Basically, it was Ian Snowball, and I. We just have phone calls, and I tell them, you know. Stories and stuff the same that way, I, talking, the same way like we're talking, right? Same same way like we're talking right now. And he wrote all he wrote all of it down, and that's the book. Oh, somebody just asked, when's the release date, and what label is the Ten City album on? Uh, the Ten City album is on Ultra, and I don't know the release date 
uh, yet. I don't, you know, all I, all I pay attention to is, is the songs and the music and, uh, release dates and stuff like that. Everybody else worries about that, but I, I just try to concentrate on the song. I know I should, uh, concentrate on stuff like that, but I, I don't. So I, but I think the, uh, album is coming out in September, September or October. Okay. Do you feel it's a comfortable time to release with COVID going on? And the club, no, scene, being, but, and the club scene being what it is, non-existent right now. No, but I don't care. I just I just wanted to come out. I, I, I think we got some pretty uh, great songs on there. And I wanted to come out. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, when COVID is over, hopefully... Uh, I, I come up with something else. <laughs> good, good. I'm looking to see if there's any questions anybody have for you. Um, making a song, Black... Oh, Annette Phillips had said something. Making a oh, song... Miss Happy! Yes, Annette Phillips has been banging away right. Hello, Annette. How are you, girl? <laughs> That's making Ms. a song, Black Lives Matter, she wrote. All right? Mm-hmm. Making a song, Black Lives Matter. Well, uh, we have we have something for people that are socially conscious, and I'll, and I'll leave it at that. Question also came in from uh, let me hold on, asking about is Byron on uh, uh, Christian Cristiano Galbraith asking is Byron on the vocals? Uh, of course. They don't know. Nobody knows who the real new Ten City is. Oh, yeah. Byron is doing all the vocals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Did he do all oh. the vocals on the original Foundation album? Yes, he did all the vocals on the original Foundation album. Yeah, he's lead sing- Ten City's lead singer. Uh, yeah. You can't have Ten City without Byron Stingley. You can have Ten City without Marshall Jefferson, but you can't have Ten City without Byron Stingley. <laughs> That's what a lot of bands like not having it's like the Tramps. I know Tramps have a few bands now, but without uh, uh, Jimmy Ellis, the vocalist, it doesn't sound like the Tramps to me. It's hard. Yeah, I I, I felt like that too. Uh, you know, they had a re- they had a different vocalist when I worked with them, and he was really good. But he was, you know, he wasn't he wasn't a. Yeah. Oh, real quick, somebody says, please, Lenny. Ask Marshall to tell us about the production process of the house music anthem. Can you quickly just break that down? The pro- production process. process of the hot house, of, of the house music anthem. Uh, I was on the, I was working at the post office. I heard the song in my head. I went home. I got all my equipment. And I came up with the drums, the bass, and the piano. I called up Curtis McLean, Rudy Forbes, and Thomas Cox. Man, I got a cut. Let's go to the studio. Meet me at the studio. Went to the studio. Laid it down. Rudy played the solo. Curtis sang the vocal. Uh, came up with a rough mix, and that was it. Took it down to the music box. No, took it to the Sheba Baby Club where Mike Dunn, Hugo Hutchinson, and Tyree Cooper were actually living. Gave them a copy on cassette. They played it on that sound system. Then I took it to the music box, and Ron Hardy played it on his sound system six times in a row. And the crowd went off. And that's in a wrap. That was it. Uh, The complete session, start to finish, took about two, three hours maximum. And, uh, yeah. I always, uh, I didn't, uh, I rarely composed music in the studio. I always had it completely prepared all you know all, everything 
uh, the piano, the drums, the bass, the strings, all that was played uh, at home before I got to the studio. So when I got to the studio, <clears throat> in those days, all I had to do was push the start button and then everything would play back and we would record it. Well, you hear that, people? He wrapped that up like a can of tuna. That's what when you're that? paying by the hour, boy. That's right. <laughs> so when you were quickly in there, you're trying to hold on to those coins. That's right. You, 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 you're working you you working with air. You used to say you're working with air. It's like you have no money. You got. It's like how are we gonna make this work, right? Yep. Who I had to, I had to pay for it myself. <clears throat> Praise the Lord! You heard that he came to his own pockets to prove a point that he's talented. And he's proven it. Who inspires you today? Somebody asked. inspires me yeah i guess makes you say hey i like what he's doing i don't know somebody ever asked that question <laughs> you don't get inspired easily i can see inspires me everything is so formulaic now and everybody's pretty much sticking to the formula you know and uh, I just have disagreements with the formula. So I'm going to try to do something different. Okay. That's a good yeah. one. I'm sorry. <laughs> no. What's your typical approach to new production nowadays? Uh, my typical approach to new production now. Uh, <clears throat> either it's good or it's bad. <laughs> good. That's a good one. I like that. It's either, either we're going to go with this or it's, gonna, it's not good. Either it's good or it's bad. You know, uh, a, good, a good song will form new genres. You know, it'll give somebody else something to follow. You know, so so it's if it's if it's good, people will follow it. If it's bad, nobody will follow. But uh, you could. My philosophy back in the day was you could do any style as long as it's good. And uh, you know, I, I'm still trying to uh, stick to that today. As long as it's good, uh, people listen to it and. And, uh, you know, do what they want with it. Do you have any go-to gear you use now that's like your go-to, like the way you talk about your JXAP and the Yamaha and stuff? What do you, what's your go-to now <clears throat> here? Uh, well, pretty much, this, pretty much most analog keyboards. You know, you can do everything uh, in your computer. But sonically, uh, they haven't quite caught up to analog keyboards yet. Uh, digital keyboards have always sucked, in my opinion. But a, a good analog keyboard has like a fullness to it, you know. And and uh, that digital keyboards don't quite capture that yet. They're getting closer, but they're not quite there yet. So I. I I'll continue using analog stuff. All right, though, that's that's a wrap, Jack. You gave us everything we needed. Oh. And we love you for it. And we love your honesty. I hope so. I hope nobody gets mad at me over this. They man. always get mad at you, but then they get over it. So what? It's Marshall Jefferson. We all love you no matter what. Even when you say it, it is, it is. The other last question, I'll leave this with you. Somebody asked, what is your favorite all-time house record? Hard one. I know it's tough. I know even for me, I'm um, 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 um. Oh, that's tough. That's a tough man. Oh man, that's tough, man. 
Oh, man, that's really tough. I can't name anything. All-time favorite house record. Oh, oh man, so many, man. It changes, it, and it changes weekly, too. So I, I, I can't say, man. I can't say. Uh, oh, you stumped the joke, uh, man. So you many. Stumped it, you stumped it. All right, what's your favorite all-time rock record? <laughs> it's no one record, man. It, you know, it's, it changes weekly. How how can you say like one one song is your all time favorite, man? I mean, ooh, it, I it changes all the time. And this is what people are you gonna be wanting to tell you. People are asking me questions. I'm like, oh, that's you know, I, I understand. Give you the I, I'm like, hey, I understand that. You know, I'm not the one here but, going, hey. You know, that, the answer it. is it, it changes. You know. This, yeah. it, it, it's great. It's, it's, there's, a, there's a lot of great songs out there. It is tough to just pick one. Okay, so before I close up, because I got to roll, and, I, and we, have, we, we held you down for longer than we expected, but there was a lot of good questions you answered, and thank God you did this, because we needed to hear this. Can you give the people your personal advice on this music thing, this music industry thing? Like, when somebody asks you, hey, I want to get into this, do you recommend me, you know, giving up my job and doing this? What would you say to somebody young coming to you? Don't give up your day job. Uh, when I first started, there were 50 to 100 new dance records coming out a week. Uh, now there are over 100,000 dance records a week coming out. And everybody that's uh, putting them out of their the average song. When you have a hundred thousand songs a week, the average record is making McDonald's money. That's the average record. If you come up with a hit, a hit now you you'll be lucky to make a thousand dollars. Which you, if you work with somebody else, you'll have to split. So that kind of go, comes out to McDonald's money too. So you have to come up with a plan. You could listen to what everybody else is doing and, and just do your live streams and put out records that no DJ in the world will hear uh, without a recognized name on it, they won't even click it to preview it because that's right. That's what you just said. Correct. Without no, a recognizable name, no, no DJ in the world is able to listen to one hundred thousand songs per week. Think about that, right? So you have to make yourself known before you quit your job. How do you do that? You promote yourself. Don't do remixes because nobody cares when there are 100,000 releases per week coming out. Don't do remixes. You're wasting your creativity. Uh, do a, a whole album on yourself. Promote yourself as an artist or promote an artist. Uh, you know, if you pair with a singer and a musician, and do an album, promote that album, promote that artist and come out of the crowd because everybody else don't know what they're doing. When? If, they're, if they're like part of that 100,000 songs a week pit, yeah. right? That's wasting everybody's time because nobody's getting recognized and nobody's getting paid. Mm -hmm. So, you have to think about things like image. You have to have an image. You have to promote that image. And you have to, uh, you know, you have to make yourself known. You have to pay attention to your social media and all your, all your channels and develop yourself in a, as an artist and promote yourself as an artist and uh, make yourself uh, well known. And, uh, as you get up into the thousands of followers, you know, that that spring that springs everything else, you know, that gets everything else coming to you. And that's when the majors come in, when, you know, 
when you get up to like when you get up to like the hundreds of thousands of followers, then okay, people are gonna want you then because you'll be able to go to go to a label and say, hey, look, I have I have hundreds of thousands of followers. Uh, you know, what do you have for me? Because labels are lazy now. They don't want to promote you. They don't want to develop you as an artist. They want a ready-made, ready-to-sell product. So that's what you have to become. And until you become that, you're not going to make any money. So don't quit your day job until you know how to do those things. When I first started out in the music business, I knew exactly what I was going to do. I knew I was going to make records and I knew I was going to uh, make money doing it. I knew exactly how to do it, come up with hit records and, and uh, you know, make a career, just, make a career. Yeah. Make a career. But uh I knew how to do it. I, I said, hey, well, I go to the pressing plant, I'll pay to press up some records and I'll put my record out there, right? But that was then. It was much simpler then. Now you got to you gotta go through all these channels and if you're not willing to put up, put in the work, uh, you've lost from day one. I, I, I've told loads of people, hey, you got to come up with an image. They don't do it. You know, and they they keep on going about their business and with they don't have the recognized name and nobody hears them. Great artists, great music, but nobody hears them because there are 100,000 songs a week coming out. 100,000 plus songs every week coming out. And on that note, wise words from a true veteran of dance music. Promote yourself. Promote, 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 work hard, promote to get yourself seen, get yourself in the position. Don't waste your energy. Put it to the right places and push everything you got in social media. Make sure your music is good, too. Don't forget, the product's yeah. still got to be really good. Don't be putting out their junk thinking you're going to get it. And on that note... And don't, don't let one last note. Don't ask for anybody's opinion of their of your music. Oh, yeah. Because everybody will tell you it's good. <laughs> right? Right, it's good. You know, if, if you ask them. But if you don't ask them, you'll find out. Right? Because if they, they say nothing, then it sucks. That's right. And on that but, note, if, but, if, but if it's good, they'll say, oh, man, this is sensational. Let me get a copy, right? Mm-hmm. But don't ask them. If it's good, I want to know your opinion. No, you don't. <laughs> you, you want me? You want a compliment? Don't ask. Don't ask. Just get, On that note, don't me. ask. Don't ask. Don't Believe ask. in yourself. Believe. Believe. Next Believe week, we got Marshall Jefferson. I want to thank you because we got to go. I, I've held this man right. long up. On a, <laughs> he's been locked to that to that to that table. But I got to jump. Next week, it looks like we're going to announce another great. DJ promoter, uh, DJ producer extraordinaire coming in. And Marshall, thank you so much again, bro. Have a great night in the UK and rock. Rock with you. Thank you, Lenny. Love you, man.